Hello and welcome to the Vincast. I'm James Scarsbrook, also known as the Intrepid Wino, and here we are in Carlton North. Um, the, it's it's spring. the The weather is improving. It was a bit cold this morning. I uh, I believe that there were some frost issues um, here in southeastern Australia. So um, probably something to keep keep an eye on. the The idea of the Vincast, of course, is to talk about wine, wine culture. But more, more importantly, it's about talking to people and getting an idea about different perspectives, different backgrounds, and, and, getting, and, and for people to understand that there are a lot of different people in wine, and they're involved in different elements of wine, and everyone contributes in some way. Everyone has a different philosophy. Everyone has different experiences. And so um, one of the episodes that I'd like to do each week is going to be sitting down, talking to people uh, again, from different elements in the wine industry, to uh, to learn a little bit more about them, and and for people to find out that there are people, there are real people behind wine, and different personalities always uh, contribute in some way. So hopefully that will help you to connect with the wines in the glass to understand that there is a bit of background. My first guest that I'll be interviewing uh, is. A guy by the name of Dave Bowley. Um, Dave is the the man behind Vintelopa Wines, uh, which is uh, um, based out of South Australia, based pretty much in Adelaide. That actually sources fruit from a, a number of different key regions around Adelaide, um, and it's a really fascinating project for me. I was introduced to it recently uh, when I got to try the wines with Dave and invited him in to, to sit down and chat. Uh, and he is really trying to do something quite different and unique. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, but um, we'll talk a bit about his background uh, and what inspires him, his philosophies. So um, thank you for joining us, David. Hey, man. Good to be here. So, Dave, um, what was it that got you into wine? Was it a particular wine? Was it an experience? What, ha- ha- how did you actually get wine introduced into your life? Subconsciously to start, actually, it's it's a really odd story. Um, I don't have uh, any kind of family background in wine or even really in agriculture. Um, I was I grew up in the foothills in Adelaide, so sort of Blair area, not really a wine sort of area at all. But um, but I, guess- I mean Adelaide wine and agriculture is pretty much one of the most important industries there i mean it's still a relatively small city so you would have come into contact with wine at some point yeah exactly so um and i used to um i went to sacred high college down in um, summerton park and driving there every day um there's actually a vineyard in the middle of um sort of marion or um park home in like seriously in the suburbs of Adelaide. In the suburb, okay. It's out the front of Marion Swimming Centre and right. I used to drive past it every day. Yeah. And I used to pretty much every day look at it and just sort of... It was a commercial vineyard. Yeah. So Petriti Wines in Adelaide uh, have a lease over the block and make uh, make wine from the fruit, I believe. Um, so yeah, I used to sort of look at it in, in amazement each day, twice each day as I drove past. Wow. Uh, and that's sort of how it began, I think, subconsciously at that level. You know, at the time, growing up, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, <laughs> and, and yeah, so like you just said, Adelaide's a small place and my dad's best mate has been involved in the wine industry his, his whole career. And at that stage, um, he, had a, he had a business importing corks from Portugal and, and uh, they had a factory down in High Marsh. So I worked there in my spare time and that gave me some exposure to just one of the aspects of of the wine industry and and in particular the kind of technical aspects of it. Um, So so it was a slightly, wine was introduced to you by osmosis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And it wasn't until I sort of finished school and looked at what I enjoyed doing and they were, you know, I I was no good at maths really. I was okay, but sport was my thing (laughs) (laughs) and uh, science was my second thing. So, um, yeah, I kind of set myself the goal of, uh, you know, getting just looking deeper into being involved in the wine industry. And at that stage, it seemed like a winemaking degree was the one to do. So, you know, that's how I did it. And then, um, you know, the story goes through some peaks and some troughs, I guess. Uh, during my time there, I realized that I was amongst, you know, 
the, the, the lowest possible percentile in terms of um, everyone else in the course kind of had family connections, whether their family owned a winery already or a vineyard or their dad was a winemaker or their dad was a vineyard, was a viticulturist. Like it was me and like one other or two other guys who had no real connection. So this course was the University of Adelaide. That's right. At, at this point, what, what campus was that on? Because uh, the winemaking was in Roseworthy at one point, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Um, I was going through between um, t- uh, 1998 and 2002. Yeah. So we're, it was at the Wake campus okay. at that stage. Sure. Uh, so up there. And uh, yeah, so that, that was some interesting times because... Um, yeah, pretty raw. Haven't had almost no exposure to. What What was your impression of the the way that wine making was was taught at Adelaide at, at that point? I'm, I'm sure that throughout the course you would be sitting down tasting wines and looking at sort of a benchmarking it. Did you get sort of international examples to look at? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, it's all that sort of stuff's a massive part of the course. Okay, but I mean, yeah, the bottom line, the baseline is that they. That's their, you know, their, their job is to teach us how to be, how to be chemists, how to be winemakers. Of course, um, there's still a, a, a large vocational element to it. They're, they're yeah. trying to take, yeah, okay. And I'm, uh, yeah, that's that's great. That's cool. Like that's their job. And yeah, not, you can't, you know, say anything bad about that. Yeah, of course. Um, so it was a great experience, and yeah, I got heaps of exposure. Not only, you know, as a part of the curriculum and academically, but I guess when you're in that environment with people who are all interested in similar stuff, uh, whether it be through the wine club or whether you've just gone down to the pub after lectures for a drink, um, someone's always talking about or thinking about or opening something interesting. So I, I guess that would have been one of the big differences with you know a lot of the pubs in Adelaide is that they would be serving a lot more wine than you would find possibly in other parts of Australia because, um, because there are so many winemakers that are either based in Adelaide or not far from there, I guess that would probably be a different experience. Yeah, it is. And I guess a lot of competition, so it mean, means it's um, reasonably accessible from a price point of view too. Plenty, plenty, of, plenty of good Barossa Shiraz. Yeah, plenty of that around. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and during that time, were you working vintages anywhere? Uh, yeah. So I guess being so raw, like, it was important to, to get a bit of experience. Um, so... Where did I, you know, I sort of spent some time down in McLaren Vale at uh, what was then Rosemount, which then became something else, which then became, I don't know, it's part of the behemoth now that is Treasury, I guess. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, down there, um, bits and pieces around. I, I was also, st- you know, still doing the cork thing at that stage. Corks were. Okay. Um, you know, so that was a job that I kept throughout um, my studies to help obviously pay for stuff, but also, you know, it was an interesting thing. And by the, the time I sort of moved into the latter part of my studies, I was doing more of the technical uh, lab-based stuff sur- surrounding quality control and, and, and quality assurance. With And and so one, once you completed that, I mean, did, so did, did that kind of give you that interest in the technical side or in, in terms of the analysis of wine? Yeah, I guess it just showed me that there's like – a lot of depth and a lot of um, varied aspects to wine and you can sort of, yeah, learn. I don't know, I just found it interesting. I, I, I'm not sure what about it. It probably just connects to me as a person a little bit, that sort of investigation sort of side of things. And so so you completed the, the course in 2002. Mm. Um, where did you go from there? Um, I went up to the, the Riverland in South Australia and worked at um, a winery in Loxton, which is a huge place. We, we processed 70,000 tonnes that year between myself and we had a team of sort of five winemakers um, and, a, you know, a big a big seller hands, a uh, big seller staff. And it, um, I yeah. mean, to put it in perspective, Riverland is where um, Casella, and, a.k.a. Yellowtail, is based. So yeah, it's yeah. pretty much the bulk, one of the bulk areas of the Australian wine industry. Yeah, it is. I mean... That would have been Hi, yeah, experience. inland irrigated areas. It's one of those, you know, they, they produce generally wines of, of uh, lower quality mm. just because, you know, like, yeah, they don't have the... I mean, I would have thought, you know, having, having that technical experience or, or, you know, fresh out of, out of um, Adelaide Uni and, and having that ability to sort of, you know, that the, the more scientific approach would have been very beneficial in that kind of environment where you are dealing with 
pretty large quantities of wine and, and, and analysis and control is a lot more important than, than small batch wine making. Yeah, completely. It was, it was a probably actually like in hindsight or, you know, upon reflection, it was a great fit for me at the time because the job wasn't actually, uh, winemaking as such. It was, I mean, it was as there was the 5% technical aspects of winemaking, but 95% of the job was just process management and sure. it was just like, um, yeah, this this machine trucks and forklifts and oh well, look, it was presses and <laughs> just like it was just a machine that was designed to take grapes and turn them into wine in the most you know efficient way possible. And there was you know ten steps along the way or whatever it was, and you know yeah. my responsibility was three steps, and I just all I had to do was just make sure those three things happened in timely fashion so that it didn't you know mess so, up with the rest of the process. Like it didn't really have anything to do with quality. It was all about just get it done, you know. Um, so in a, bit of, in, a, in a very kind of base way, you're just sort of a cog. Totally. Just on a production line. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Like that was just like the, the final part of my education, if right, you like. Yeah. So I look at it now because, um, yeah, I haven't really sort of had the involvement in on that sort of a scale since then, but that's quite deliberate. Well, I mean, considering that. what you do now, I, I would have thought that, that sort of having that experience really would have influenced your path to where you are. Yeah, well, my path is where I am now. I mean, I'm, I'm by no means am I at the destination. This whole thing's just a journey, and uh, that was the beginning of that journey. Now I just find myself, you know, walking down a path which uh, which is probably more of my choosing. You know, um, did you find? I mean, did you come out of that experience somewhat jaded about about wine and wine making? Was I jaded? I don't know. Uh, was was it different to what I was expecting? Absolutely. Sure. Um, right after that, as a complete opposite, I went to, to France and worked in a small domain uh, in Burgundy. And it was, you know, like tiny in comparison. Sure. Um, Completely different model as well. Yeah, totally. And it was all about winemaking and nothing to do with process management and nothing to do with efficiency. It was all about quality. Uh, so, I mean, that's a pretty dramatic shift to, to go from, from such a large kind of crush to, to, to go and working in Burgundy. That Was that was there any kind of big culture shock in that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, it was my first trip to Burgundy um, and my French was horrible. And, uh, and I, yeah, like I'd just come out of this massive winery where – you know, I hadn't seen, I didn't even go into a vineyard for that entire, that was a six month contract. For six months, I didn't, I was like shocking to me. I said during my first couple of weeks, I said to the senior winemaker, you know, like, when are we going to go out and see some of these vineyards? Like, are we going to work out what's going on with this fruit? And, mm. and he just actually just kind of laughed and, uh, you know, politely told me no, that's not what we do. Just go back to your desk and just focus on what's coming in today and, you know, what's coming in tomorrow. It's pretty divorced from what Yeah, but, is, you know, really like mean, that's, you know, it's different. It's, We're okay. talking about different models. I mean, that's their business. And I, I guess I didn't really understand that so, that what that's what I was getting into, like, you know, naive and young and whatnot. Um, so, yeah, complete shock to go to uh, the other end of the spectrum, although – I kind of exp- I kind of knew what I was getting into, um, and I expected to to see uh, and to be in a situation where it was, you know, quality first, and and that's why I was kind of so keen to get over there to put the exp- the other experience behind me, you know, balance it off against the other extreme, and, and, and kind of at the end of it all, see where I, where the cards fell and how I felt about the two the two sort of uh, extremes of the business and, and, and of making wine and whatnot. Um, and as it turns out, unsurprisingly, you know, I kind of really enjoyed the, the Burgundy experience much, much more. Sure. Did you stay in, in France beyond that, that, that vintage experience? I was over there for, for about three months in total. Okay. Uh, I also visited, uh, visited Germany and, um, Oh, oh well, the UK, I guess, but that's no big deal. Everyone sort of goes there, don't they? But um, oh, yeah, that's an Australian rite of passage. Yeah, it? yeah, yeah. It is so. Uh, yeah, like sort of three month tour, a couple of months working in France, a bit of time in in Germany, um, seeing some sites and drinking some German wines, and um, then came back and. So so yeah, what what was the next step 
upon returning, having had these two experiences at completely opposite ends of the spectrum. Yeah, um, it's the next step was uh, you know to find another job. I mean, it's sort of at that stage. I was just sort of focused on travel a bit and um, looking at picking up contract work here and there. So I was fortunate enough to get to, um, a pretty a pretty good job um, in terms of career sort of aspirations with um, which was then Perno Ricard or you know Orlando Wines um, based out of the Barossa Valley, and uh, it was a contract position uh, to make wine for them. Yeah. Um, but this was in two thousand and four. And in those days, in those days, eight years ago, nine years ago, uh, a lot of the production that they were doing, like this was in the in the boom time, right? And so, sure. you know, they didn't have perhaps the capacity that they needed to make all the wine they wanted to make. So they had to engage other wineries to, to make some wine on their behalf. Yeah. Um, so my job was to sort of just be the intermediary, I guess, between... The home base up in up, up at Rolling Flat and the several satellite sort of contract wineries that were making wine for us. Okay. Um, so I used to just sort of manage fruit intake into those wineries and manage the the wine production and the technical side. And so I was just constantly driving between wineries and tasting our wines and driving between vineyards and tasting sure, grapes. Sure, sure. Um, and that was really cool because that was the beginning of where I am now. I guess in terms of. I was focusing on South Australian regions other than the Barossa. And oh, okay. so you can see there's a synergy there between what I did then and what right. I'm currently doing now. Yeah. Um, so I was getting to know the regions really well Yeah. of the Adelaide Hills, Langhorne Creek, McLaren Vale, um, and even, you know, the southeast Coonawarra um, pathway down there. Okay. And, uh, yeah, so just kind of juggling around, a lot of driving, um, a lot of winemaking without actually sort of being in a winery. Sure. Like a lot of it was just done by remote on the phone. You know, hey, you know, you saw that fruit. Remember that fruit you saw yesterday? Remember that Cabernet you saw yesterday? Yeah, yeah. Yep, it's coming. This is the analysis, blah, blah, blah. What do you want to do? And I was like, okay, yep, let's do this one. And then, you know, so yeah, had sort of five balls in the air and it was really dynamic and really interesting, really eye-opening. So that was the sort of next thing and that um, that really set me up, I think, for where... I've kind of ended up now with um, – it gave me an idea of what areas were producing what quality well, you know, which, which varieties really well. And, yeah, it gave me an idea of what I wanted to be involved in going forward. So, yeah, it was a cool job actually. And, you know, like kind of working for the big guys, I've done a couple of times, not heaps. But, um, yeah, that was a really sort of pivotal part of where I am now, I guess. In terms of seeing different different regions, microclimates, sort of yeah, sub regional differences, that kind of thing. And you know what? Even down to individual vineyards, why this one on this side of the road is better than that one on that side of the road. Yeah. And, you know, because of the you know, like they'll have they, expresses differently. Yeah, the you know, Orlando has just so, such an amazing um uh, resource of 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 people and, and of knowledge and yeah, like forming some relationships with some people there and learning a lot over that. You know, it was only a brief contract of six months, but, you know, it really intense and um, it was fantastic. Yeah, really good for for educating me a little bit more and, and sort of developing, I guess, the stuff and uh, the skills I learned through my through my formal education. Right. It's just another, another sort of extension of that. So you mentioned um, earlier on that sort of one of your passions – back in high school was sport sport was sort of what you loved what you were good at um it's probably pretty hard to actually translate this through a podcast but um if you meet dave in person you'll see that he is pretty tall so um i guess it's pretty obvious there's pretty much only two sports <laughs> yeah <laughs> be ideal for one being volleyball but uh, in, in fact it was basketball i think i remember you telling me yeah yeah basketball it's always been a huge part of my life and the fa- and my family's life. Um, all my all my family's played, uh, and I've got three sisters all younger. They've all played national league, They're, and one represented Australia at uh, junior level. So, pretty talented girls. Um, I didn't quite have their level, unfortunately, but um, but I played uh, state league for ten years and it was pretty handy. And do you know any famous basketball players? Yeah, yeah, a lot of my uh, yeah a lot. A lot of my friends are professional basketball players. It's kind of embarrassing, actually, because, uh, um, 
you know, like we'll, we'll be cruising around and, you know, a couple of pretty are pretty famous, I guess you'd say, um, Olympians and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, my brother-in-law actually is an Olympian. And like we'll be cruising around and kids and stuff will come up and uh, they'll, they'll recognize them because, you know, they've seen him on TV or whatever. And they'll be like, hey, you know, hey, Brad, can, hey, Joe, can I get your autograph? And I'm like and they tall. Look at, and they look at you and go, oh, which team do you play for? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, not that old, tall, pretty fit. Yeah, so I've signed a few photo autographs in my time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, future, future wine drinkers. Yeah, you know, that's right. <laughs> once, um, once they, once they pick, put the, put the uh, pieces together. So basketball's actually been a pretty big part of um, my development for Vintelover too because um, after that job with, uh, with Orlando, so we're talking nine years ago when I was a lot younger and not necessarily fitter but more focused on sport, I guess, and... Um, so yeah, I really made the decision at that time to have a bit of a have a bit of a go at making basketball something. I guess you know my sisters were having having success with national league, and I felt like I had a bit to offer if I could sort of commit more to it. So, um, but being pragmatic, I thought I better you know like have a job still. So sure. a day um, job. yeah, a day job. Yeah. So I try to f- sort of focus my energies on getting a job, which will allow me to continue my basketball career. And fortunate enough to. Um, to find a job, find an opportunity working for what was at the time the Australian Wine and Brandy Corporation, but is now Wine Australia. Yeah. Um, it was a technical sort and of... And this was still based in Adelaide. It was based in Adelaide, which yeah. is the thing I was looking for. Um, yeah. Which was, so allowed me to, to focus on sport, basketball. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, a, it was an interesting job, a technical compliance kind of, kind of role, not winemaking related directly, I guess, but... You know, having an understanding and and um, a technical knowledge of wine making was a really important part of it. But I guess um, that, that that contract with Pernod Ricard would have fed into that as well, because looking at sort of different wines, different sites. Yeah, the travel part. Yeah, definitely was um, was a good lead in, and uh, so I ended up actually spending six years at Wine Australia. Right. Which was yeah. So the way longer than I'd planned I sure. guess and um, for a while there like after sort of three or four years I thought man like I haven't made wine for a long time I don't know if I still know how to do it and, um, uh, but it's like riding a bike I guess <laughs> um, but yeah I, I just, I, you know that stage I wondered if I was ever going to get back into it and I, you know, I sort of had those concerns about my career because I really enjoyed you know like making something sure like it's really f- sort of primal I guess but um, yeah, yeah. I, li- I like the idea of yeah, I made that. Uh, okay, you know, fair enough. Um, so yeah, I've, uh, that was le- that led me up to uh, December two thousand and ten when I, I resigned, and uh, at, but of course at that stage, Vince Loper had already had already begun. Um, uh, Vince Loper started sort of in earnest, I guess, September two thousand and nine uh, with the first release of. 2008 with Clarenvale Shiraz and 2009 Adelaide Hills Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and then, so December 2010, I kind of felt the time was right to um, to focus on Vintelopa, which at that stage was just in its infancy, I guess, but giving me so much pleasure on a day-to-day basis. And, uh, if, yeah. If, if Vintelopa at that time was in its infancy, when was it actually conceived? Good question. It was conceived... Um, in 2008, this is a, again, you know, just an example of how life can sort of throw things at you and from you think you're going down one path and then you come to a crossroads. Um, in 2008, I almost bought a bar in Adelaide. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Hadn't made wine for ages, was wondering what I was going to do in the future, didn't see a long-term future with Wine Australia because of just the, the way that they were structured there, very sort of uh, bottom-heavy and, and not, not many places to go professionally. Sure. Uh, almost bought a bar. Me, me and uh, two colleagues uh, set up this company and we we bought this bar. We'd paid the deposit and the vendor, uh, we had a contract. The vendor decided that they weren't going to sell it anymore. Um Gave us our deposit back, and 
actually on the way to one of those meetings, I had a, you know, like that when the deal was happening, I just had a bad feeling that it wasn't going to happen, even though it looked all positive. I just was, my gut told me it wasn't going to happen. And mm. on the way to one of the meetings, I said to one of the partners, hey, if this doesn't work out, I've decided I'm just going to start making wine because. Did you have any idea how to go about that? How to go about <clears throat> making wine? No, but I mean, like, like the logistics, the, the the actual sort of where you could make it and how you could find fruit and that kind of thing. Yeah, because that's I guess sort of glossed over that that six years of wine <laughs> Australia, didn't I? But part of that job, like during that job, I went to every wine region of Australia. Sure, I would have visited eighty percent of Australia's wineries. Sure, wow. Uh, you know, spent that most of that six years driving between. You know, Great Western or wherever, the Hunter Valley or, you know, weird out-of-the-way wine regions that you don't even Margaret think River. of. Margaret River, totally done that a few times. I mean, even... And so you would have come into contact with a lot of different kind of winery models. Heaps of different winery models, spoke to loads of different winemakers, got a great feeling about regions and their specialities, and that was so valuable to... And, and extended the experience that I'd had in that job with Orlando um, and really helped me understand that, um, you know, I think we do some things really well here in, in Australia and we don't, some other things we don't do so well sure. in within the regions themselves. Um, so we should focus on what we do well. And what I do you felt think we do well. I think we do Clare Valley Riesling, except I think it's world class. I think we do, I think Coonawarra Cabernet is world class, although I have no interest in making it. Um, at this stage, I think McLaren Vale makes just stunning Shiraz, um, and it reminds me so much of of the Rhone. You know, if you're talking outside of South Australia, Tasmania has incredible potential to make Pinot, being so cold down there. Um, these are all generalisations. I of think. Course, of I think course. the site within within the regions, the site is so important. Yeah, I have a real um, chip on my shoulder about the Adelaide Hills, and I think um, Pinot Pinot Noir in the Adelaide Hills has a massive future. But some of that might revolve around actually kind of tapping a few people on the shoulder and saying, "Hey, um, your your site's probably not much good for, sure. for Pinot. Do you sure. mind do you mind grafting it at something else for sure. the, for the greater good? Because sure. um, yeah, like." Some some sensational sites there, but there's also some rubbish sites. Uh, I mean, I, I know that, like, in, in looking at your wines, you, you're very much championing certain varieties in certain regions or certain sites. Is, is that sort of what you think we need to be focusing a lot more of on and, and sort, of, sort of cutting the fat uh, and focusing on what, what is done best? Yeah, I do. Um, it's... There's a fine line. Uh, it's it's certainly a double edged sword, but yeah, like in any business, you you know you need to find your niche, right? You sure. can't you can't be everything to everyone. Sure. And just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. Right. So yeah, I, I really firmly believe that we should look at doing that. It's just you know uh, it's, it's hard. Yeah, it takes someone um, to start the process, and that, that might need to be someone big. And at the yeah. same at the same time, this is a commercial prospect this this is a business so to some people think, yeah yeah unfortunately there's always going to be that element where people are going to try and do as many things as, as possible to try and connect with as many different customers because as we said people have different you know, specific tastes and one person might say i only drink pinot grigio and so if you're not making a pinot grigio you're missing out on that one customer but but at, at the same do you time, want like, that customer i don't yeah. know like yeah, yeah. <laughs> well I think you know a lot of that is to do with with education, experience, and just sort of getting out and making people aware of um, of what is done best in each each of those regions. Mm. Sort of make, making sure people understand that every region is different. And, yeah, and, well, and that's so that's part of what I'm trying to do, I guess. Um, yeah, say to say to people, and you know, even I break it down further in some cases with Riesling. My Riesling in particular is from Watervale, and that's. People was like people are always asking where's Watervale. Um, yeah. So I explain that's in the Clare Valley, which is which you know sort of the home of Riesling in in Australia. Some sure. people depends on what market you're in. They sometimes argue about that, but um, you know then I go further and say, hey, you know within Clare Valley they've got you've got Watervale, 
which is known for you know floral and blah blah blah. And then you've got different, you know, you've got Claire Claire for real, which is the further north, and you've got Polifuel River, and you've got you know, uh, there's just sort of Leasingham. There's different areas within Clare, and you know that's that's a great vehicle to kind of educate and uh, sure. yeah, it's pretty valuable, which is why I'm sort of into that. Uh, and so, if it was conceived from that 2008 vintage, um, in terms of where where you've made the wine, I guess, and and correct me if I'm wrong, but you basically you're sourcing fruit from uh, growers or you are leasing a vineyard. Yeah, I am. Um, but but the interesting thing for me is, however you want to call it, but I kind of think of it as that virtual winery model or that virtual estate model where um, you're looking at multiple sites, multiple regions even, um, and the, there, is, there isn't really a winery specifically because, of course, you're looking at a couple of different regions, one of which is a little bit further away from Adelaide. Um how has that evolved in the last sort of few vintages? I mean, you've probably grown quite a bit in just sort of four or five vintages. Yeah, it's a difficult one for people to get their head around, I guess. Um, but it's actually really common. Like, you know, there must be 3,000 wine wineries, in inverted commas, in Australia. How many of those actually have their own winery? Mm. It's probably less than half, I think. Um, so, yeah. So, so for all intents and purposes, 3,000 wineries is probably more 3,000 brands or 3,000 yeah, sort of licenses. I kind of cringe like. when when people refer to it like that. I don't know what the correct nomenclature is, but, um, yeah, you know, like when people yeah, – I hate the idea of uh, thinking about Vinterloper as a brand. It's more – it's – I mean, well, it's less. It's, you know, it's, it's not – it's a uh, – I guess probably one of the big problems with it is that people kind of make a distinction between a brand and a person. Yeah, and, and and what you're trying to say about Vinterloper is that those things are intrinsically linked. You, pretty much, you you are Vinterloper. Yeah, yeah. Whether <laughs> whether I like it or not, I've, I guess I pretty much am. I am interested, actually, Vinterloper. What what where did that come from? What is it? What meaning does it have to you? Uh, it's well, it's a play on the word interloper, um, and and and, and, in, and in, when you're thinking of a name for your winery. Um, a lot of them have been used or, you know, you, you, you need to think of something that... It's going to resonate. Yeah, w- whether it's your winery or whatever. You're selling pencils or underwater woven baskets. Um, so, yeah, just a play on the word interloper, which is kind of a philosophy that I felt suited me then and stu- still suits me now, being that, you know, an interloper is someone who comes into an established order and just kind of does what they want. Um and not worrying about what other people say or think about them. So it's a play on that. And uh, But for the astute listener, interloper is spelt with an R in the middle. And I chose to drop that because, um, so to spell it uh, vint eloper, because I also kind of like that aspect of um, of the escape of, you know, and so, eloper. you know, to elope is to escape. Yeah. So yeah, it kind of those sort of things mashed together in a blender and buzzed up, and then there you go. Vinterloper. No, that's good. I mean, what, one of the things that I, I really love about uh, Vinterloper is that you are so well connected directly to your consumers, and obviously you're very much uh, utilizing social media platforms to to connect. Um, do you think that's a really really important tool with which to communicate, educate, and obviously? sell the wines yeah the selling comes way down the list um yeah it's a massively important tool for me because i don't have well i don't have a marketing budget i mean it is <laughs> i was gonna say i don't have a lot of money for marketing but i just don't have any money for marketing sure um and you know that's i'm really comfortable with that because people these days are savvy they are they you know they know when they're being marketed to and yeah and that's why i say selling is way on a list of like course. I never, you know, when I'm tweeting or when I'm posting pictures on Instagram or putting stuff, content on Facebook or, you know, um, doing a mix set for my SoundCloud or whatever it is, but I'm never trying to sell my wine to someone. It's sure. just all about communication to me. It's about a conversation and, and a relationship. And a relationship. And you know what? If because of our relationship or because of the communication we've had this week, if, if you go to a restaurant and you see my wine on a wine list or if you go to a bottle shop and you happen to see it on the shelf, and if that encourages you to buy it, then 
but well, I think then awesome. I think that's so much more enriching because people are having a personal connection. Yeah, and and and, and again, having that personal connection with you, the the pretty much the person that is Vintelaper for all intents and purposes. Yeah, yeah. I I want to be accessible to those people. I want to. I, I want those people to a pick up my wine and then take a photo and send it to me and ask me a question about it. Or, you know what? I'm also really happy and really comfortable if you don't order my wine. You get something else, but you say, "Hey, man! Like, I was at this place and I got this wine. Have you have you tried it? What do you think?" Sure. Like, you know, gets the discussion going. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Like, it's it's all focused around wine, and it's all. But it's at the same time, it's also creating more engaged and and educated yeah. consumers, which yeah. is really what I think is just it's sort of lacking a little bit. Yeah, well, you just used it, the e word engagement. It's all about engagement. Sure, and. Uh, yeah, a conversation. It's the new world. I love it. A, a really fascinating way of connecting with your consumers that uh, I was introduced to recently was the Urban Winery Project. Now, the Urban Winery Project, yeah, talking about engagement, that's uh, that's what that was all about, actually. Um, it's t- sort of turned into a, a bit of a cult, I guess, in, around Adelaide. But um, the original process, the original idea was just doing really engage people and as a kind of artistic and sort of cultural educational thing, I guess. It sounds really noble when you put it like that, but, it, I mean, I'm not about, I don't, you know, I don't, want any, I don't want any prizes for the stuff that I do, but I want to, I want more people to drink wine, especially young people. Sure. Um, so, yeah, the, the concept, to give you a bit of a background, um, Vintage and the Adelaide Fringe Festival – so the the best Adelaide is kind of a sleepy town, right? But it's in be, it's getting better. But yeah, but it's also the festival city of Australia. The best time to go to be in Adelaide uh, is March. It's called Mad March. Sure. And we've got the Fringe Festival, the Adelaide Holy Festival. Festival. You know, you've got um, the weather's amazing. You got the cricket. You've got. Uh, what else happens in March? You've got, well, the V8 motor racing, if that interests you. <laughs> um, hey, it brings a lot of people to the city. Of course. Um, You've got all these amazing events and they're kind of all crammed into March, right? But that's also the time we're making wine. So years and years were happening when, well, not years and years, but, you know, when I was starting Vintelopa, 09, 10, um, I wanted to go to all this cool shit that was happening. Yeah. And, but I was busy in the winery yeah. a long way from the action and uh, <clears throat> kind of thought, wouldn't it be nice if rather than missing out on all that stuff and rather than trying to get people to come see me at the, at the vineyard, what if I um, what if I found a space in the city somewhere where I could <laughs> where I could bring the grapes uh, uh, and my barrels and everything and just kind of set it up and make wine there and just have it open and people could come see me there in the heart of all that action. Yeah. And uh, – Try to get it up for 2011. It was really late, really late notice in 2011 and just couldn't find the appropriate space. Like it's pretty hard to find an appropriate space for a winery sure. in a city. Sure. Um, but uh, there was this famous location on the corner of Grenfell Street and, and Frome Street in Adelaide, which was formerly an outdoor furniture store. And it had this huge courtyard in the back and it was this derelict sort of art deco building. It had been vacant for like five or six years. Yeah. And, you know, every person with an entrepreneurial bone in their body in Adelaide at one point or another had walked past that space and seen it and said, hey, I've like... Be, wouldn't it be good if? <laughs> wouldn't it be awesome if we could do X with this space? Sure. Um, and like them, uh, yeah, I'd done that. And it was just the perfect space for a winery because it was kind of outdoors, but it had some cover and it was um, uh, southeastly facing, so... You know, afternoon sun during the hot periods wasn't really an issue and it was concrete and uh, had good drainage and had running water and it had all these things. And so a very a flexible kind of location. Great space. And so I just basically found out who owned the building and I begged and I pleaded and they said no and I continued and they said no and then I said, right, whose car do I have to wash? Whose dog do I have to walk? <laughs> what do I have to do? You know, and I think they just got sick of me hassling them, and they knew that if unless they said yes, I was just going to continue. So you're you're basically Bart and Lisa sitting in the back seat. Yeah, like, can we have a pool, Dad? Can we have a pool, Dad? That was it, 
And they just, they finally, I guess they just thought, let's take a punt on this guy. Yeah. Um, and they said yes. So that was in 2012 uh, for Vintage. And it was a, just a massive success. I guess um, I didn't realize what I was getting myself into. Um, but people just embraced it. It was, yeah, um, yeah it was try awesome. And, different. Yeah. I, you know, and again, on the social media thing, if you check out Vintiloper on YouTube, you'll see some videos there. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's some, there's some really great sort of footage and, and yeah. photos on the website. Give you a great idea of sort of what it was about yeah. and what, what I, what I transitioned from to, and then if you watch the 2012 video first, um, yeah, that'll give you a great idea of what it started as. And then the following the, this year, 2013, um, I did it in the same space, but it was a little bit different because, um, some guys decided they wanted to open a bar in that space. Right. And I guess, I mean, just during that period or, yeah, or ongoing. Yeah. Well, it's turned into ongoing, but it, originally it was just during that period, I guess, you know, I approached the landlord again and, and um, he chose to let them uh, take the space um, right. but helped me to convince them to let me share it. Okay. Um, so I was still doing it in the same space. Kind of thing. Yeah, I guess. Um, but I just had a really different vibe about it. It was still awesome. Um, and the video is great and it shows a lot of people having an awesome time. Um, but it was different. It was sure. different. Sure. Yeah. But I mean, you're certainly going to be doing it for 2014 vintage. I've got some exciting plans for 2014. Yeah. Well, um, what what better reason to um, to stay connected with uh, with Vintiloper on the various platforms, Twitter, uh, Instagram, yeah, Facebook, yeah. than to to keep uh, abreast of the the exciting developments with the Urban Winery Project for for 2014 vintage. Um, People can hit me on Twitter at Vintiloper, and the same with. Uh, with Instagram at Vintiloper and the same with Facebook actually. <laughs> if you just, yeah, you put Vintiloper into a social media thing, you'll probably find me. Sure. And uh, yeah, I mean, like what what better reason do you need to go over to Adelaide during March with all that kind of activity going on? So perfect opportunity. I do um, suggest uh, if you do see Dave out, he's, he's, he does uh, stand out from the crowd. Uh, <laughs> that height of his probably one of the tallest winemakers I've seen with possibly the exception of um, Roberto Verzio's son who, who, who was also actually he was a volleyball player funnily enough um, well this is it's, it's really fascinating talking to you Dave um, obviously you know if you can if you want to sort of see my impressions of the wine you can visit my uh, my blog but um, it's it, I guess it's it's really interesting to sort of find a bit about your background and, and kind of how that plays into what you're doing now and moving forward with Vintiloper. Yeah, thanks. It's been good to go through the story, I guess. Don't really um, go over those early years too much anymore, I've got sort of focusing on going forward. But yeah, um, yeah, it's so important to think about where you've come from and and how it shapes you for where you're going. Sure. Yeah, so I really enjoyed it actually. Thanks. Um, if you visit the Vintiloper website, uh, you can get all the information, all the ways to connect with, with, uh, with Dave and his winery. Um, uh, I believe you can also purchase directly from the website, but you know, you will find Vintiloper, uh, in a lot of really good independent wine stores, um, and on lots of really good wine lists around the country. Um, do you export much at the moment? I don't export at all. I've never exported. Okay. Um, but I'm going to Singapore soon. Uh, that's and exciting. Yeah, yeah, that's going to be good. So Singapore, Hong Kong, um, and, and China are on the on the to do list. As is the uh, the uh, the US. I'm really keen to get some wine over there. I think. Uh, Great. Yeah, be a lot of fun to sell wine there and experience the culture as as uh, I visit the market. I'm yeah pretty keen for that. Yeah, well, um, thanks again. Make sure that you do connect with, with Vintiloper on all those different platforms uh, and um, that way you can keep informed about all the exciting things that he has planned for the future. So uh, thank you very much, Dave. James, thanks for having me. Uh, remember to, um, to subscribe to the podcast. Uh, visit me at www.intrepidwino.com to, uh, to find out about all the exciting things that I get up to these days. Um, and I hope to see you guys again soon. Thanks for listening. Bye.